Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 Excellent. Uh, thanks to y'all for showing up. This is the third installment of the Artivism, the Power of Art for Social Transformation initiative. Uh, today, we are so delighted to have one of our alums, uh, Julian McBride, who is a graduate of the criminal justice and anthropology programs at Adelphi University. He was also at one point a, a very prestigious member of the Criminal Justice Club serving as El Presidente. And uh, which is why it's even more delightful that we have another member of the Criminal Justice Club, Secretary Kathleen Beatty, who will be introducing Julian. Now, before we get started, I want everyone to take a look at the uh, caveat going on here on your screen. Uh, not only is this event recorded, so if you have an issue being recorded and you don't want your image recorded, just turn your camera off. I'm hoping most of you guys will keep your camera on, uh, but I wanted to give you that opportunity to turn your uh, video off if you didn't want to be videotaped. And also Julian's presentation today is designed to inspire emotions and to evoke emotions but some of the images may be difficult for folks and may evoke memories or trigger um, some unexpected feelings. And so I want you guys to be aware of that. So with that, I would like to pass the torch to our student ambassador, Kathleen Beatty. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Kathleen Beatty um, and I am a criminal justice and communications double major in the Lovemore Global Scholars Program at Adelphi. I'm currently the secretary for the Criminal Justice Club. I'm the president of the Integrated Council. I'm a peer assistant leader and a sister of Tri Delta. Um, so tonight in my role as an Artivism student ambassador, I'd like to share a little bit about the clothesline project that the Criminal Justice Club organizes every year on campus and how you, your club, your organization or your class can get involved. Um, so this event is coordinated with Take Back the Night, which is, happens later that night, and it's scheduled for April 22nd with a rain date of April 29th. Um, and we're hoping that by then enough students, faculty, and staff will have been vaccinated and at least some will get to enjoy this outside exhibit in person. So the students that will work the event will, of course, um, practice all social distancing, mask, and other COVID safety protocols all day. If you are interested in participating, um, please feel free to contact me or Professor Lake, and I will put our emails in the chat. Um, so according to the Men's Rape Prevention Project in Washington, D.C., 58,000 soldiers died in the Vietnam War, and during that same period of time, 51,000 women were killed, mostly by men who supposedly loved them. In the summer of 1990, that statistic became a catalyst for a coalition of women's groups on Cape Cod, Massachusetts, to consciously develop a program that would educate, break the silence, and bear witness to one issue, violence against women. This small core group of women, many of whom had experienced some form of personal violence, wanted to find a unique way to take a staggering mind numbing statistics and turn them into a provocative in your face educational and healing tool. One of the women, visual artist Rachel Carey Harper, was moved by the power of the AIDS quilt, represented, presented the concept of using shirts hanging on a clothesline as the vehicle for raising awareness about this issue. This concept was simple, let each woman tell her story in a unique way using words and or artwork to decorate her shirt. And once finished, she would then hang her shirt on the clothesline. This very action serves many purposes. It acts as an educational tool for those who come to view the clothesline. It becomes a healing tool for anyone who makes a shirt by hanging the shirt on the line. Survivors, friends and family can literally turn their back on some of that pain of their experience and walk away. And finally, it shows those who are still suffering in silence to understand that they are not alone. October of 1990 saw the original clothesline project with 31 shirts displayed on a village green in Hyannis, Massachusetts as part of the annual Take Back the Night March and Rally. Throughout the day, women came forward to create shirts and, kept, and the line kept growing. Outreach about the event created an overwhelming national response and brought the clothesline project from a single local grassroots effort into an intense national campaign. At the moment, we estimate that there are about 500 projects nationally and internationally with an estimated 50,000 to 60,000 shirts. We know of projects in 41 states and five countries. 
and this ever-expanding grassroots network is as far flung as Tanzania and as close as Orleans, Massachusetts. Adelphi's clothesline project began with a focus on interpersonal violence directed at cisgender women and girls. Over the past 15 years, the project has evolved to recognize the wide range of sex and gender-based violence, including violence aimed at transgender, gender non-binary, and intersex people. A survivor is defined as a person who has survived intimate personal violence, such as rape, battering, incest, or child sexual abuse. A victim is a person who has died at the hands of their abuser. The Clothesline, honors, the clothesline Project honors survivors as well as victims of intimate violence. Any person who has experienced such violence at any time in their life is encouraged to come forward and design a shirt. Victims, families, and friends are also encouraged to participate. It is the very process of designing a shirt that gives each person a new voice with which to expose an often horrific and unspeakable experience that has dramatically altered the course of their life. Participating in this project provides a powerful step towards helping a survivor break through the shroud of silence that has surrounded their experience. Please join us in making this powerful visual display on campus this spring. And now I would like to introduce our main speaker today, Julian McBride. Um, Julian McBride is the director of the Reflections of War Initiative, a nonprofit organization he developed as an undergraduate student in the criminal justice and anthropology departments at Adelphi University to tell the stories of victims of war through art and research. Through his research, Julian has participated in forensic anthropologic projects in Greece, presented research at the NCUR conference in the University of Memphis, at the PCUN, the Psychology Coalitions of NGOs, accredited by the United Nations, studied human rights abuses and war crimes in the Balkans and the Middle East, and written for periodicals such as the Ancient Origins magazine. From his research on genocide, he's developed partnerships with the Assyrian International News Agency, Greek Genocide Research Resource Center, Althea Artists Shedding Light, and the ATOP Meaningful World. Julian was a double major in criminal justice and anthropology with a minor in sociology at Adelphi. During his time as an undergraduate, he served as the president of the Criminal Justice Club, was awarded with the Janice Smith Memorial Award, presented his research at NCUR and Adelphi University under, at the Adelphi Undergraduate Research Conference, and was inducted into Lambda Alpha Honor Society. In his spare time, Julian writes for multiple journals and science outlets and recently co-published an article in the February edition of the Ancient Origins Museum magazine. He is also a veteran of the U.S. of the U.S. Marine Corps and served in Afghanistan. While we're watching the presentation, feel free to chime in via the chat to make comments and ask questions that we will revisit at the end of the talk. And without further ado, welcome Julian. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. My name is Julian McBride. I'm going to present uh, my presentation called 1915 and Beyond. Sorry, I'm just going to get this together. Okay. 1915 Beyond Reflections of Wars and Genocides and the Brutality of War. For those of you who know who I am, my name is Joy McBride. I'm a forensic anthropologist. Hi, Joanne. I'm an independent journalist. Hi, mom. <laughs> um, so um, this event was brought together by myself, um, primarily because I use art therapy. Art therapy is a therapeutic practice of expressing yourself to um, pretty much meditate PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Post-traumatic stress disorder is anything that could trigger or bring forth um, prior traumas and genocide, or just war in general. It could be a sexual assault victim. Um, you could pretty much domestic violence, a veteran, anybody could have PTSD. And my goal is to shed light on PTSD through art as a form of expressing yourself rather than communicating. Acknowledgements. Um, 1915 and Beyond is dedicated to all the victims of war who perished in large-scale massacres and genocides. And to survivors who have never held their stories told in history. History is always written by the victors, but this time history will be written by the victims. Just before I start, this presentation does include some graphic images that I've drawn, including images I've brought forth from the, in from the internet. If you don't wish to continue because they may seem graphic, you could leave the 
chat. No one's penalizing you. Um, just a heads up that they could be very triggering for anybody who has a uh, trauma. Okay. Art therapy is a form of psychotherapy. It helps with PTSD, mental distress, disabilities, disease. People who have Alzheimer's use art therapy all the time. It gives them a sense of remembrance of their past. Uh, 1940, it was brought forth to the United States by Adrian Hill and her doctor, doctorate, art versus illness, brought forth art therapy to the United States. What is genocide? Genocide is an attempt and part of whole to completely wipe out a nationality ethnic group. It could be cultural, such as destroying ancient relic shrines like we saw ISIS do in Syria and Iraq the past five years. Or it could be full-fledged genocide, such as against the Armenians, Jews, Bosniaks, and currently the Rohingya in Myanmar. Here are universally recognized genocides, such as the Holocaust, Rwanda genocide, and Bosnian genocide. Genocides that aren't universally recognized due to politics and geopolitics, Native American genocide, Assyrian Greek Armenian genocide, Holdemore, which took place in Ukraine, and genocide of the Congolese under King Leopold, which is something that's rarely talked about in history. This is my first drawing that pretty much got me into art therapy. I did this under Professor R.G. Alger Rockus as an independent study when I presented at University of Memphis. This is a Greek veteran who was decapitated. Um, his body was severed, but his on uh, doing anthropological research, Professor R.G. Algerakis and Professor Notis Algerakis found the body and the head of this veteran were able to match it up and retell his story. In the 14th century, during the Ottoman conquest of Greece, this veteran uh, was a commander in a fort called Polystylon in Western Thrace, which is located at the Red Star. Over 20 years, the fort was besieged by Ottoman forces. The veteran suffered a jaw wound, as you can see during the curve right here on his chin. Uh, they were able to fix him up through uh, medical surgery and he still led the defense. Eventually when the fort fell, he suffered a brutal head wound to the head right here, most likely a large scale weapon such as an arrow or battle ax and his cranium was completely crushed. Afterwards, his body was decapitated but I'm gonna continue the story through the second slide. When his body was decapitated, it was actually a way to mock Christians as a way because early Christian practices basically said, if your body wasn't whole, you couldn't go to heaven. So that body was decapitated post-mortem and separated from his body. But the people, the uh, citizens of Polystylon who survived the siege, they were able to place the head towards east of Greece, which is very, very crucial. East of Greece is Jerusalem and the Levant region. And that represented that his head was facing towards the kingdom of heaven, as an early Christian practice were to say. Eventually, Professor Algerakis and Professor Notis Algerakis found the severed head of the ancient veteran and his body in the early 90s. And I presented research through their guidance at NCUR over this veteran. And this is what got me into art therapy originally. This is the third century skull of an ancient Roman who actually had uh, surgery right here to relieve swelling on the top of his head from a fort. This veteran was actually located in a fort that belonged to King Philip of Macedon, but was then inhabited by the Romans. So that also showed early Greek migration into Italy before the Roman conquest of the Mediterranean. And the swelling right here was relieved uh, to the back of the head, as you can see the two round bald spots of his head of medical swelling. This also got me into medical anthropology as well and practices that involved it. These, um, some of my favorites, because these are Armenian women during the Hamidian massacres, if they were programs against Armenians, Assyrians, and Greeks located in Asia Minor by Sultan Abdul Hamid II. 
after military losses in both the Balkans and the Russians, he took out his anger on the second class citizens of Asia Minor, which were the Christian population. Some, some of them took, became militia, militias, took up militias and took up arms against the Ottomans. Overall, two to 400,000 Christians were killed during the programs, but these two ladies actually ended up surviving. One of them on the right is actually Derek Sherinian, a world famous musician, that's his great grandmother. So because of the fact that she survived the programs, he was able to live today. And this is dangerous nationalism, which one of my favorite captions that I've ever done. It's okay to be a nationalist, but it's not okay to be a blind nationalist because you have your blind nationalism believes that no matter what your government is never wrong and you believe anything your government were to tell you. This is one of the main problems in history and why genocides happen is because the government will largely blame a minority ethnic group for their problems rather than blaming themselves. And if you do enough propaganda between media, uh, racial discrimination, anything is bound to happen, including the worst things. These were two Armenians who were executed by the Ottoman government right before the genocide. And there are very, very much parallels in history where you saw 1939, Jews were out light, banned, boycotted in Berlin, which ended up becoming the Holocaust. In Rwanda, you saw mass, like early massacres and hatred against Tutsis by the Hutu-led government. The UN stood by, did nothing. And right now in Myanmar, Rohingya pretty much have been expelled from their homelands. Atrocities against the Syrians, as you can see, this is a seven-year-old Assyrian girl starved to death alongside her siblings. Dehydration and mass starvation was a primary method of execution during the 1915 genocides. Continued as well, Seifo is the Assyrian name of what they call the genocide. Seifo means sword. A primary method during the genocide was cutting people in half with swords. And that's how Assyrians remember it, that they were butchered to death and no one came to help them. And this world is never really black and white. It's always gray. There is no good side in anything. A lot of times in history, you'll see, you'll see, hey, the Americans, they helped liberate the Jews, they saved the Holocaust. Believe it or not, about 80% of US companies were actually collaborating with the Nazi government. Volkswagen, which is still sold in the US today, was a major component and of the Holocaust, along with the Vatican as well. So this world is not always black and white where you say, this is a good side, this is a bad side. Right now, we go, our government portrays us as a good morally right when it comes to military action, in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Libya. But if you were to ask the average citizen what they think about US military occupation and bombings, it would be the complete opposite of it. And these were crucified Armenian women. I'm just gonna forward, forward this. This is wartime sexual assault rate. I'm just gonna fast forward this image real quick, but I'm basically going to explain how women were actually sold as slave markets a lot of times during the Ottoman period in Damascus, which is a main hub for where women were sold off as sex slaves and concubines to military officials. During Cyprus napalming, not sure if anybody knows the history of Cyprus, but overall, it wasn't just an ethnic conflict between Greece and Turkey. A lot of it had to do with both the United Kingdom and US interference in Cyprus, which raised tensions in the island to a boiling point. For example, the Cyprus napalming of, I mean, the Turkish napalming of Cyprus was largely sanctioned by the United Kingdom at the time, which didn't want to relinquish the island at all. The UK considered Cyprus an island as an unsinkable aircraft carrier, which is still a term used to this day. Cyprus is the main hub for any military air force to conduct operations in the Middle East especially in the early 50s, 60s, and 70s, during the height of the Arab-Israeli wars, where the US and UK 
were highly, highly involved in the Middle East. This is a Syrian refugee. Not sure if anybody remembers the real actual image of Omran, who was displayed throughout 2016, but an airstrike hit over his home and he never cried at all. Um, it's mainly because he was so desensitized to the violence that, you know, it's just, it was a norm. And it just makes me think how much we take advantage of our privileges here. We go, we wake up, we brush our teeth, we get to enjoy our lives, we go to the park, we go to museums, and we go to bed, we have four walls and a roof over our head. About one fourth of the Syrian population doesn't have a roof over the head. They're literally laying in mud right now. Refugee camps are just so bad. They're facing abuse, um, stereotypes by uh, far right nationalists saying all refugees are quote unquote rapists or monsters. And these are just kids that just want to find a home that they should be in school right now, enjoying their lives. Childhood and teenager and your teenage years are the best years of your life that you'll never get back. And kids like Omran, all they're going to remember are these bad memories. And this is really not fair. That's why I just say never take advantage of where you are, where you came from. I'm going to go away from war, but I just want to talk about trauma, especially domestic violence. This is a picture of Nicole Simpson. This is actually the first drawing I ever did. It took me about two months, as you could tell, because I try to make it perfect. But I just wanted to show how like trauma is just really, really deep and powerful. Everyone knows the, the OJ Simpson trial and how the family never received justice. But I just wanted to show somewhat of an image. The real image isn't displayed, but in my mind, I displayed what Nicole Simpson's final moments of her life looked like before rigor mortis and postmortem. Now, this is a wounded Iraqi girl, 2003. Her father was abused by US Marines. She just wanted to go hug her father, but she couldn't. Her father was detained and beaten right in front of her. And this was one of the main, main reasons why a lot of Iraqis took up arms against the US occupation. When you, there's one thing when the United States says Saddam is a bad man, but when you start abusing the citizens just like Saddam did, you're just bringing them into a whole nother nightmare. And this is um, an Afghan airstrike. This was a German Afghan strike in Afghanistan in Kunduz province in 2015. Approximately 90 to 100 people were killed when the German Air Force accidentally hit oil tankers, which is right by a nearby village. Over 300 to 400 Afghans suffered third degree burns. 150, 200 plus civilians were killed in these raids. To this day, Germany has never really gave reparations for this airstrike, but this was one of the main turning points in the war in Afghanistan, which also ironically happened about three months before President Obama uh, announced a troop surge, which is about an extra 50,000 troops in Afghanistan, which is when public opinion really, really changed during the war. This is my personal favorite drawing because I call it a cycle of violence, and I just want everybody to hear what a cycle of violence really is. So overall, this is a nine-year-old child. I'm going to keep this on the screen because I just want everyone to display, just imagine what it's like to be a Yemeni right now. So this nine-year-old got on his bus, was on his way to school, just minding his own business. Airstrike hits the bus, kills all the kids. The families come. They dig up the body parts of their children. It was a Saudi Arabian, it was an airstrike by Saudi Arabia, but the missiles were made in the United States. So you pretty much have the United States backing a very, very theocratic and brutal regime, which killed their children. These same parents, locals, they're gonna take up arms in frustration against Saudi Arabia and the United States which in turn, sometimes it'll lead to terrorist attacks here or terrorist atta or attacks at our diplomatic stations abroad. 
now the military industrial complex here and hawkish politicians will use this as an excuse to continue bombing more military interference and interventions in the Middle East. Now you just have one big full cycle of violence continuing and continuing that's nearly endless. And I just wanted to display this because right now the United States is concerned, right now is concerned to be in an endless war. Afghanistan is concerned endless. As of last week, President Biden authorized an extra 4,000 troops in Iraq over high intentions with Iran. So right now that's looking like an endless conflict. And right now we have no exit strategy in Syria and that could pretty much be another endless conflict for the United States. Sins of the father, each year Africa suffers tribal tensions and conflicts. A lot of people think it's just, oh, it's just African problems, it's just African tensions. A lot of it was divisions created during the colonial era. How, how did European powers conquer these nations? It was easy. It was a divide and conquer method. For example, if you go to Rwanda, the Belgians backed the Tutsis over the Hutus originally. And here's why. According to Belgians, Tutsis were lighter skinned black people. They had smaller noses. They had more elegant lips. So they demonized another section of the population, the Hutus and gave the Tutsis a little bit more privileges, but didn't treat them the same way they would treat the average Belgian. So that divide and conquer already works right there to where you don't have to send a full-fledged military to do your work in Africa. You pretty much turn the locals against each other. And to this day, a lot of these conflicts are born from this div these divide and conquer methods. And child soldiers, I can't express this enough to this day. Child trafficking is one of the biggest things in the world and using children amongst war is still used to this day. ISIS used Cubs of the Caliphates. The Lord Resistance Army led by Joseph Coney was a known full children army, kidnapped children. We see it all the time, even during the height of the Latin American wars, children were used in conflicts. And it's just something that needs to end. Children deserve to have their own life of their own. And it's just a shame that it comes to this. Okay, so this is a woman who was post-mortem burned during the firebombing of Dredden. Uh, Allied forces, both the United States and the UK, decided that Germany, uh, particularly the city of Dresden, which, uh, which was a military hub, that they just wanted to destroy the city outright. Even though there are military targets there, they knew that there are over 25 plus civilians trapped in the city. But instead of just using regular munitions to bomb the city, they used napalm outright, napalm and incendiary weapons. And a lot of them, they use oxygen bombers. If you don't know what oxygen bombers are, they light the air on fire. So during the height of the two to three day bombing of Dresden, the Oxygen was so hot, it was close to about 6,000 degrees Fahrenheit, which only a nuclear bomb could be hotter than that. So a lot of people, not only did they die painfully, they also died by inhaling the oxygen, which burned their internal organs and lungs. Uh, massacres of Nanking, the Nanking massacre, which was Imperial Japan, over a brutal, brutal period during the occupation of then the capital of the Republic of China, outright slaughtered uh, Chinese civilians, primarily for sport, which was even covered in Japanese media, looting, fires, uh, burning people alive, burying people alive, cutting people with katanas, and even killing babies, which was considered sport. Japanese officers were actually promoted just for the number of kills they would have as civilians that were left behind. And to this day, one of the reasons why Japan and China have so much tensions is because Japan never fully apologized or paid reparations for the massacre of Nanking. This is a Syrian Arab soldier. Um, he was beheaded by ISIS. 
And I just wanted to show that um, people who are fighting for their homelands right now, a lot of us, we take advantage of where we are. It's one thing to be here, you know, defending your home from a burglar. These people are defending their homes from not only a terrorist group like ISIS, but multiple militaries, multiple armies around the world. And you see innocent Syrian soldiers who just want to go back home to their families. They're caught in this crossfire of this never ending cycle of violence. And here we have an allied soldier who is from Belgium who is helping a Germite, German shoulder, soldier, sorry. And I, just, I call this caption Brotherhood Without Borders because at the end of the day, the young people are always fighting a rich man's war. You see that happen all the time. Malcolm X, Muhammad Ali, they put emphasis on things like this where you have 17, 18 year olds dying all the time while the rich politicians, they drink their expensive bottles of champagne, eat steak and lobster while someone else is fighting their war for them. And this was the great famine of Mount Lebanon. This was actually a precursor to the 1915 genocide of Armenians, Greeks, and Assyrians. For those who don't know, the great famine of Mount Lebanon is considered the fourth genocide of the Ottoman Empire. During World War I, the French had a naval blockade against the Ottoman Empire in the Mediterranean. And the only way food could get into Lebanon was through Syria. The governor of Syria at the time was called Dijamal Pasha. He was nicknamed the Bloodthirsty. And he purposely halted food in Lebanon, Mount Lebanon, for two reasons. One, to blame the French overall of the impending starvation. And two, at that time, Mount Lebanon was autonomous. A lot of Mount Lebanon population was made up of Maronite Christians, and they were autonomous under French autonomy rule. So this was the Ottoman Empire's way of getting back at France as well. Over four to 500,000 Lebanese, mostly Maronites, were starved to death. They largely had to rely on grass, wheat, dirt, even eating their own cannibalism, pets. It was just a really, really horrible, horrible time period. And what a lot of people don't realize is that Lebanon per capita had the highest casualty rate in World War I. They lost over 50% of their population during the Great Famine. And well, if you'd like to stay connected or need any historical references, you could email me. I'm gonna keep the screen up for a little bit. For those who don't know, I am the new assistant editor of the academic, academia section of the Middle East Journal. It's gonna be called Nor Media. We're launching May 1st. I'll be in charge of history, anthropology, archeology, span and geopolitics of the Middle East. So you'll be seeing a lot of articles coming out of me in early May. I'm also an independent journalist. I plan on flying to different countries who are facing civil strife around the world. Lebanon, Cyprus, Ethiopia, Yemen, Armenia, China, Mali, Libya, even Myanmar. Hopefully I could be there, even though there's a military junta right now. Latin America, such as Chile, Venezuela, Brazil. And I plan on doing this through self-funding. I just opened a Patreon page. Uh, my link is right here and black and white. You could just Google um, Patreon and look up my name, Julian McBride, or nickname, Julian Anthropology. I'm also on Academia. You can read my publications on academia.edu. And my work is at www.roinitiative.org. And I'd just like to thank everybody for coming today. And I'd like to open up the questions for anyone who have any. So proud of you, Julian. Thank you, Mom. <laughs> uh, Kat? Yeah, so thank you so much, Julian. Um, so before we open up the questions, um, I'd like to announce that the next event in the series is going to be Bake Back America. It's um, going to be Monday, March 8th at 4 p.m. Uh, Big Back America shares a powerful and motivating message that inspires vision of social change for kindness and equality through creative ways of giving back. This presentation will encompass videos, pictures, and presentations that empower individuals to bring their creative concepts to life. 
Um, so now I would like to ask if there's any questions for Julian, um, feel free to use the raise hand function or ask your chat in the question, but that was an amazing presentation, Julian. If you guys have questions, you can put them in the chat or you can raise the hand with the hand function and we will call on you. I'd like to begin by asking Julian how his art helped him to process some of the things that he saw and experienced as a Marine um, in the quote unquote war on terror. Well, one thing is art does something that pictures or the media doesn't, it tells a story. Art is, not, art is always subjective. It doesn't have to be a perfect piece. As long as it tells a story, it brings forth questions such as what happened? What's the story behind this? Pretty sure everyone here, when I saw my images, you're like, what really went on? And that's my goal is to get people asking questions and critical thinking, you know, this isn't exactly the most black and white thing, like what happened, how this is going. And this is how I, I reflect on stuff that I saw where I couldn't just speak about it. Everyone else, everyone speaks about it. And, you know, everyone can listen to it, but the next day they're going to forget it. When you draw something that sticks in someone's head for a long time and it gets them thinking and makes them want to do research more and more. And that's my goal is to, is to eventually reach people to speak out more and more and to get them thinking, because if I could reach one person, I know I'm doing something right and just passing it on. Great. Uh, Jonathan, you have a question? Yeah, I have a couple of questions, comments. I wanna thank you for your presentation. It was, it was informative about like some of the horrors of war and some things I've like witnessed from uh, studying this subject are kind of, and even reading like the biographies of like brutal dictators and people, they're very like paranoid. So like they project kind of the problems onto like people, as you said, like in the racism and resentment. And there's also like some historical grievance, what they sometimes do. And something I'm trying to figure out is like, how do you de-radicalize de people? How do they get radicalized? Like I thought, you, I forget the name, like the Tootsies and the other group, I think where you talked about where the differences were kind of elevated to the point like, they were kind of turned against each other. So I'm curious, like, is there a way to like de-radicalize people or like kind of repair after? Mm. I always say, um, you're never too old to be educated. You learn something new every day and more and more people are educated and you talk about this stuff and less and less likely this happens. Like everyone, there's always this key phrase in life. Racism is never inherited, is always taught. And hate is never inherited, it's always taught. And a lot of times you see these countries that are going through strife, they don't have access to basic textbooks, educational material, stuff like that. That's one of the reasons why I created my NGO is to you know, raise funds, do fundraisers for textbooks, basic readings, help build schools, stuff like that, to where youth, even adults could have these forms of education and can mediate with sometimes tribes that they've always had this these tensions with and if you could just get two tribal leaders to sit down and talk uh, talk their problems over and come to common ground i believe change eventually starts there one thing i just wanted to comment on that's a great question jonathan and you actually said the key word how do you repair the relationships and this is where truth and reconciliation and other alternatives, um, it, it's necessary but not sufficient to hold certain people accountable for war crimes or atrocities. But as we've seen, this is often with just the retributive function of punishment, it's not enough. And so a lot of uh, borrowing from what happened in South Africa and in other places around the globe where there was strife, uh, a truth and reconciliation program, if done properly, if done well, can bring the community together to at first acknowledge what happened for folks to take responsibility. And that has shown uh, to be one of the most healing functions. Uh, the other thing I want to mention just about the, the Hutus and the Tutsis, like with my students reading about the ick right now in class, 
it wasn't a, an historical um, uh, anger between these two groups that was just natural and brought up. It was intentionally cultivated by the Belgians. The Belgians were the uh, colonial power du jour at that point in Africa. And they intentionally, and you guys should see, um, see echoes of this in how the United States and so many other countries function. Those in positions of power pit groups against each other, give a little bit more to one group, say, yeah, we're, treat we're exploiting you and your resources, but at least you're not Tootsies. You know, we'll give you a little bit of status. And that was the origin of the, anti you know, the um, antipathy between those two groups that you'll find over and over and over again, whether you're talking about the United States pitting uh, Irish immigrants to the United States against recently, you know, the diaspora of African Americans fleeing the South um, or other immigrant groups pitted against other, it's the divide and conquer philosophy. Yeah, Anthony, that applies in America as well. Um, you know, scapegoating, using one group to blame. I mean, when in doubt, I tell my students this, if you really have to think about, I mean, the, there's a lot of reasons for social problems, but who really is to blame? Who has the power to screw things up so magnificently? Those in positions of power. And so they deflect from this by scapegoating, by pointing fingers at a relatively powerless group and pitting groups of people against each other, if that makes sense. Ronnie Kennedy had a question. Oh yes, Ronnie. Um, how do you research which archives do you see? And then Alana is up next. I basically do research through millions of different platforms. One thing about independent research is you never stick to one source, you never stick to one media. For me, I never rarely, rarely reference mainstream media. It is primarily academic source, whether it's through university library archives, journals, primarily scholarly journals is what I recommend the most, and eBooks. I rarely look at mainstream media articles. For example, back in 2003, there was this article in the New York Times was justified the war in Iraq which I read in high school and it sounded so, so beautiful. And in the United States Middle Marine Corps, I believed it as well. Then I took classes with Professor Stephanie Lake who just taught. And you know, my perception of foreign intervention changed completely. There was nothing good about the, United, the war in Iraq. Everyone says Saddam was a bad man. Saddam was a monster the United States created. That's rarely talked about in school. Saddam was 100% backed by the United States during the first Persian Gulf War against Iran. Donald Rumsfeld personally visited Iraq, advised the, Irani, the Iraqi military on the ground. And Saddam had a stockpile of chemical weapons that was largely given to him by countries such as Germany, the United States, and the UK. Originally, Saddam was our best friend, guys like him. He used chemical weapons against Kurds and Iranian civilians, we didn't do anything about it. It wasn't until Saddam started threatening our bigger best friends, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Israel, is where Saddam eventually became on the CIA wanted list. That's why I always say this world is not black and white. There's no such thing as good and bad. The United States at the end of the day is looking out for its interest, whether, and a lot of times, millions of civilians will always pay the price when the United States looks out for its own interest. Mm -hmm. Did Alana have a question? Yeah, I mean, not a question, more so a comment, if that's okay. Sure. Um, hold on. So thank you for this presentation. Like literally I've been to many um, virtual in-person um, presentations since I've been at Adelphi since uh, last year. And this is by far my favorite, not to be biased, just because, and this is like probably the weirdest thing you'd ever hear, but um, my dad's family is all Armenian. So I know very well, like what you're talking about, like my family's gone through it. And like, in a way, it, this sounds so weird. I don't mean to be weird, but like, 
I got almost like excited when I like saw that you were talking about it because the reality is that like literally this is the first time that like in a school setting somebody has actually spoken about this that's like not like somebody being like you know bashful to me if I mention and be like that's not true which has happened unfortunately I'm sure um for any of the other countries listed here that has happened as well so just like keep doing what you're doing it's if you don't think people appreciate it they do because I really appreciate it because it's so important to keep the conversation going and like I said this is literally the first time in a school setting this has ever been spoken about which is it it's a good thing but also kind of concerning so just keep doing what you're doing and good work thank you thank you Alana that was really I don't you know they don't you guys know they at this point they don't do a great job in high school and it's not high school teachers fault it's this bizarre curriculum that they impose on teachers and high school students um the fact that the Armenian genocide was pretty much whitewashed um I, has Turkey acknowledged it yet no, no they haven't. how do you you know it's it's breathtaking because everyone knows about the holocaust as we should although there's some people right now who even deny the holocaust in, right here in the united states um but most sane people um understand the holocaust happened and you know understand that but genocides like the armenian genocide is completely i was in grad school before i was ever informed about what took place yeah i mean in my high school they didn't talk about that at all they also really didn't talk about slavery. So, I mean, they talked about like a little bit like the textbooks, but like it's not, you know, they don't talk about the history. They don't even talk about really white history. They don't talk about history of other ethnic groups, which is a huge problem with curriculum. And it goes back to what you're saying about like the government basically telling us what we're going to learn. If the government is going to keep telling us what we're going to learn, we're not going to learn stuff that doesn't they don't want us to learn so yeah it, it sounds, sounds sad, but. you know an intentional act um this is what power does power protects itself and you know you you teach from the perspective that you think i mean no if you get a chance read anything by noam chomsky you know he talks about propaganda and how how easy it is to control your population if you are a military dictatorship you're in north korea you just bludgeon people into complying. If you're in a democracy, you have to be much more clever about your propaganda. And so you use the media and you use the educational system and you use all kinds of extensions of the hegemonic, which just means the people who control how people think. Um, and that's why it's so powerful that artists you know, you see that, let's say you've never even heard of the Armenian genocide. You see those images and you're like, wait, how did I, how do I not know about this? You know, how is that possible? That's, that's what this series is about, right? It's um, artivism and um, speaking through art or, or, or um, art being the channel by which you can speak about other things, right? Every one of Julian's presentations for how many years now, Julian, are you speaking? Maybe three, right? Uh, three years, four, four years. years. Since 2017. Yeah. It's four years. The topic is always his art and how art served as therapy. And then he gives you all the other um, topics that may not be um, allowed, maybe if I could say that, if not allowed, but out there. Right. If you wanted to, you know, do a presentation like this on, I mean, on, or, you know, or, or on all of these genocides, all of the ones you spoke about, it may not have been okay. Let's do it, but you found a voice through art, right? And that's exactly what this this series, this year long series, is about: is giving people the opportunity to speak about, um, you know, social change and you know, just everything that's that, that's happening through art. So this is this is the path, right? Make sense? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And one of you guys, I think at least two of you took my social terrorism class, um, Daniel and Julian. Yeah. You may re you may remember, you know, I'm a college professor and I had to give like a caveat before I had to actually say, like, okay, guys, what we're gonna talk about right now is 
one of the two, con considered one of the two um, third rails of academia. One is guns. I'm a criminologist, so I have to talk about guns. But the other one is Palestine. And people have lost their jobs by talking about the situation between Israel and Palestine at universities. Uh, there have been boycotts. There have been, it's, it's the new, it, it's not new, but it's the issue that no one wants to touch because they don't want to open that can of worms. And through art, people like Rachel Corey, who was a young student like you, um, went, to, um, went to the Palestinian territories and was reporting on what she saw. She was horrified. And she was run over with a tank, with an Israeli tank. And so her book, My Name is Rachel Corey, was based on her um, writings about that. Um, but that's another issue that, you know, it's bizarre. Like academia is the place you're supposed to be able to talk about everything. You don't have to agree, but that's the whole point of education. Okay, let's see, do we have more questions from folks? I also put emphasis on what you just said, Professor Lake. Uh, the whole point of learning is to get out of your comfort zone, is to shatter the norms that you've been taught your whole entire life. I'm, I'm telling you right now, as someone who served in the military, been around the world, I was taught directly in schools, the United States was the greatest country in the world. Everything was fine. I haven't had school plays where Native Americans and pilgrims completely got along. And boy, your perception changes when you actually like start doing independent research on your own. Hmm. Do we have any questions, additional questions from our audience? You can either raise your hand or just yell out. Okay, well, um, if that's it then, we can close up. Um, look at the website right? Uh, look at the other um, presentations. They will be going on until the end of the year. Um, email us, reach out. Thank you so much, Julian, again, as always. Anytime. I also want to encourage you guys, if you want to serve as a student ambassador, contact yes. me, lake at adelphi.edu. We still have a couple slots left. If you're doing any, any kind of creative work that, that can be perceived as transformative, you don't have to be a traditional artist. If you're doing fundraising, if you're doing something like the Clothesline Project with your group, um, if you'd like to get involved with the Clothesline Project, email me or cat lake at adelphi.edu. If you want to join the Criminal Justice Club, look at all these Illuminati. Look at these fabulous people. The club rules. Okay, so uh, thank you so much. My students have to stay on. You get a 10 minute break, but you're back here at 750. My students. Everyone else is permitted to exit the Zoom. Thank, thank you. you guys for coming. All right, thanks for having me. Take it. Bye bye. Bye Jonathan.